holding me He set your son down and set me free Everything of this world was fake I'm pressing on till I see your face I will live the world with the light. I will stop until your kingdom comes. Here we go. Because you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love. And it won't. You are alive in us. Nothing can save your place. You are all we need. job praise team thank you so much hey folks have a seat for just a second welcome to grandview on this gorgeous fall slash summer morning isn't it great having this extra nice warmness going on we've really enjoyed it if you're joining us online thank you for being here today we're so thankful to spend these next few moments with you lifting up the name of jesus uh, if we haven't had a chance to say hello hi it's great to see you looking forward to spending some time with you and getting to know you better in the days to come if you're a First time guests, and you've never filled out one of our connection cards, if you wouldn't care to do that, we'd be so appreciative. And we have a small gift for you as well. Also, just want to mention that if you didn't grab one of these guys, this is not only all the important stuff that you need to be aware of, but it also has Ryan's message notes on the back. So be sure and grab one if you didn't, and a pen if you need it, and then you can stay along with the message a little easier that way. We've got a lot of things we could talk about, but I'm not going to wear you guys out. Just want to mention that this Saturday is Trick or Treat Street on Main Street in Mead. And it's not a huge event, but it's a fun event. And if you'd like to be involved, there's an, a link there. You can sign up and just love on the kids with us as they come by and get some treats. Also, I just want to mention that the uh, books that we have out there are designed to get us praying for not just the United States of America, but the whole world. And uh, especially with the situation in Israel like it is right now, if there's ever been a time for us to be praying for the people that are far from Jesus, now is that time. So these are great prayer guides. If you haven't picked one up, please grab one of those. And uh, we know that it will be a blessing to you. Now, I also want to mention that today is the last day to grab um, an Operation Christmas Child box. And uh, Miss, um, yes. Miss Brummer, Chris, is back there holding one up for us there. And uh, we have a few left, and we'd love for you guys to fill that up this week and bring it back next week. It is our last shot before they have to get uh, taken into Denver. So if you don't uh, haven't done that yet, make sure you do that. And I know that it would be a blessing to somebody. You'll never hear about it this side of heaven probably. But just know that when you sow the seeds, that God takes it from there. So if you haven't done that, grab one of those boxes. Now, if you'd like us to pray for you about something, this is your chance to raise your hand. Yeah, there are several of us that could use some prayer. I can see that. Wow, that's a lot of folks. And we've got a lot of folks that aren't here today that probably need our prayers. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer and lift up those concerns that are on your heart, and we'll lift up the situation in the world as well. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we humble ourselves this morning, mindful that you are God. There is no other besides you. We're not just going through a religious motion here. We're talking to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You've invited us into the very oval office of heaven. And what a privilege it is to come before you 
and to tell you that you are great and that you are good and it's a privilege to be known by you. It's a privilege to make you known to those around us. We want to praise you because you're praiseworthy. We want to thank you because you're so incredibly good to us. We want to acknowledge the fact that we are sinners in need of a, a Savior and we want to acknowledge the fact that we need to confess our sins, and when we do, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come before you needy people this morning, Heavenly Father, and as I think about all the hands that went up just a moment ago, I'm reminded that most people are carrying a burden, and some are willing to even lift up their hand and let us know about it. So, Father, whether it's sickness or a job situation or a family problem, any kind of issue that is weighing on their heart, Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that right now as a family, that as we pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith, we're praying that even right now you'd be working on their behalf and that you would be gracious to meet their needs in a glorious way. We pray too, Heavenly Father, not only for the folks in our church family, but the people in our community in this region, Father, that don't know Jesus. Father, there's so many folks that still don't know about Jesus. They don't know about the free gift of eternal life through him. We pray that you'll help us to be on mission with you as we reach them. And then we pray for our country in this time that's so challenging uh, with the economy and with the political situation starting to heat up, Father. We're just asking for your grace to be upon those in authority over us. And then, Father, we especially are heartbroken over the, the tragic loss of life and the, the grief that's going on in the Middle East, particularly Israel and Jerusalem. And uh, we pray for the surrounding countries, and we pray for their... Uh, the grace of God somehow to come through and to touch people's hearts and that uh, there would be a swift and uh, gracious ending to this war, this conflict. And for, for those that have already lost loved ones, Father, we pray for grace for them as they mourn the unexpected, uh, terrible ways maybe in some of their loved ones have passed. We pray for that, Father. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem as your word tells us to. And now we just want to stop and say thank you again for the privilege of being able to worship together. We pray that you'll be pleased to bless our time of worship, that you'll bless our time in the Word. You'll encourage us to continue to be on mission in reaching this community and this world for Christ. In his powerful name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you so much, folks. Let's stand and continue to worship together, shall we? By the power of the Holy Ghost, a new wind is blowing right now. Breaking my heart, breaking my heart of stone, taking over like it's Jericho. And my walls are all crashing down. battle. 
So I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful.
some people in the building this morning in the sound of my voice, that God just wants to remind you that he's got you. That no matter what you're going through, that he is with you every step of the way. That he is supporting you. Let's sing Rain Came, Wind Blew. Let's be reminded that God is with us in those things. Rain came, wind blew, when my house was built on you. I'm saved. built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Father, we praise you this morning, knowing that you are in the midst of all those things. God, that you are greater, that your word says that nothing on heaven and earth can separate us from your love. I pray that this morning that our hearts would be soft to the word that you have to speak through Riley and that we would come away with knowing more of Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Mason's doing great. How's everybody else doing? You guys doing good? Well, at uh, this time, kiddos, you guys can go ahead and head on over to kids' class. That would be kinder all the way to fifth grade. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Um, the rest of us, super excited for today's message. Uh, if you don't have an outline, I want to encourage you to grab one of these bulletins in the back before we get started. I uh, got some good, good uh, Bible verses on there. Um, speaking of kiddos, um, has anybody, does anybody actually, I, I just want to ask this, does actually anybody really enjoy the game of Monopoly? Show of hands. You enjoy it? Okay. How many of you actually play Monopoly and fights don't break out? Can I see any? I don't see any hands. Okay, maybe one hand. Well, okay, good. I actually feel a little bit better. Uh, the other night, you know, I was trying to like do something, you know, for my family. And I was like, you know what? It's been a while since we've done like a family game night. And so I think this is a Friday night. Yeah, because we had the Mead football game on Thursday. And so I was like, you know what? Let's go ahead and play a game. And so my son runs into the other room and brings up uh, it's like a junior Monopoly, and so it's complete with like a rubber ducky as one of the characters, you know, it's a quicker version, and I'm like, this is going to be nice, this is going to be great, you know, great family time, and uh, I, I mean, I kid you not, like 10 minutes later, we've got uh, one kid throwing a temper tantrum, throwing a piece of the board game, the other kid's storming out of the room, there were many tears, there were many arguments, um, man, I could not believe it, and, and I'm like, I had good intentions, 
Um, and so I know that probably one of the questions you're thinking about, Ryan, did you win the board game? Is that what led to all of this pain and suffering? Um, I was going to win, okay? I had Boardwalk, Park Place. I had the Green Zone as well. I had Yellow. I was set up. But because of the amount of, of like fussiness from the kiddos, I'm like, you know what? You guys take my properties. And then they were happy for like a minute or two until they went head to head, you know, and started tearing each other up. But I had good intentions. It was just an all out war. Well, my, my, you know, you're probably wondering why am I even mentioning this? That's my segue into talking about our series and talking about the invisible war. Um, it wasn't an invisible war. It was a real one, and we felt it very much so. But we're going to be continuing on in our series today, The Invisible War. If you haven't been with us, this is your first time, or maybe you've missed a couple of weeks, you're probably wondering, well, what is this all about? Well, we're talking about this unseen war, one that is seldom talked about um, or seen with our physical eyes. There is a spiritual battle. There's a spiritual war that takes place behind the scenes that a lot of us we don't even know about. A lot of us are unaware of it. It's not a war that necessarily we can see or that we can touch, but there is definitely a spiritual realm. The Bible talks about it. God talks about it as well. We're not just physical beings, but God created us to be spiritual beings as well. And so there is a war that goes on every single day. Uh, temptation, deception in our own lives. Um, it's also brought about throughout the world. The fighting that takes place behind the scenes. Um, there's fighting for the souls of mankind. Yeah, there is a battle that is taking place. Many of us, you know, we're striving for comfort. Many of us are stri striving for prosperity, and we, that's what we want in this life. But what is going on spiritually behind the scenes? Uh, first week, if I'm to back up two weeks, we talked about God's discipline, because before we got to this invisible war, we wanted to make sure, we wanted to balance it out we don't want you guys to walk away thinking that the devil is in everything. You know, he's in everything where, like I shared the analogy, you spill ranch on your new shoes. You're like, oh, it's the devil, you know. It was him. He's out to get me with that ranch package. No, we want to balance it out with that God sometimes allows different things to happen in our life for a reason. Maybe it's the consequence of our own sins. And God wants to use it to get our attention. God's intention is always to bring us back on track. I, I shared this two weeks ago. Not everything is from the devil, but God wants to use everything. Would you agree? He wants to use everything, everything that we go through. And then last week, Bruce did an awesome job. He talked about God's pruning. It's a very difficult concept to really grasp for a lot of us, but we need to understand that God's work is always to make us better. Probably the best way I could describe it is like a skilled surgeon or a physician. He has to make an incision, a cut, in order to remove something bad from our lives, or maybe to make us even better, to make us even stronger. Maybe, you know, some of you have had like shoulder surgery, you know, and you don't enjoy the process that you have to go through, but on the tail end, you're like, okay, that was worth it. I'm better. I'm stronger now. And that's God's intention in our lives. He wants us to be more fruitful. He wants us to be stronger as well. He wants to bring out the very best in us. And so although, yeah, the devil's not behind everything, God wants to use everything, we also need to understand that God is not the cause or behind everything as well. Bad things happen in this world. Accidents happen as well. But God wants to use everything. Does that make sense? He wants to use everything in our lives. And we need to understand that behind the scenes of it all, God is trying to use things and he's allowing things, but God is ultimately in control as well. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We have Bibles um, in the back as well. If you don't have a Bible, we want to encourage you, please take one of the Bibles. That's our gift to you. We would love for you to take that home, write your name in it, write notes in it. I love highlighting my Bible. I always have a pen or a highlighter on me, just writing different things that really sticks out to me and, and how God's speaking to me. So I want to encourage you guys to do the same as well. But we're going to start off today in Ephesians chapter 2, and this is such a great section. I was just going to do a few verses. I'm like, no, I can't. I can't just skip over these amazing verses. So we're going to read through verses 1 through 10, but then we're only going to talk about um, maybe two of them. And so starting off, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, 
in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when you were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been uh, saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so first off, in this section, I just have to touch on it real quick. Um, the, the, the fact is, and we all know it, but I just want to address it, none of us are perfect, right? None of us are perfect. Not a single one of us. You might think, oh yes, I found the perfect church, and I found the perfect pastor. Well, guess what, y'all? Keep looking, okay? Because this is not a perfect church, and I am by far a perfect pastor. You want to see my imperfection? Just spend time with me, maybe for coffee. Or the first two minutes, you'll get up and walk out, okay? We are not perfect. Not any of us are perfect. Mankind is not perfect. But Jesus is. Jesus is. And because of Jesus, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by Jesus alone. That is how we are saved. And so I have to mention it. We just talked about it. We just read it, okay? Second, what this verse teaches us, we have an enemy. I don't know if you caught that there. We have an enemy. It actually mentioned three. Did you catch it? It mentioned that we have three different enemies. I'm going to go ahead and read it again. Um, But verse 2 and 3, it says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, verse 3, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. You know, today you might think it's kind of weird talking about the enemy, and I, so I do want to just give this disclaimer before we get into these three different enemies. I believe that this is important. When we were, Bruce and I were praying through a message series, we had a, a feel-good message series in mind, but God kept leading us this direction, and I firmly believe the reason why is because a lot of us, whether we realize it or not, are going through difficult times and going through maybe some spiritual warfare stuff because the enemy doesn't like it when you are following God. Enemy hates it when you are following after Jesus. And so he's going to do whatever he can to distract us and get us to go about faith. But keep in mind, God wants to use it to make you stronger. And so the important thing with this message today is it is important to spend a week in talking about our enemy, or I should say our enemies, the three enemies that we have. Because intelligence in war is vitally important. You think about the importance of intelligence. It's important to know, first of all, who your enemy is, and then where your enemy is, and what your enemy is trying to do to you. So that way you can anticipate, that way you can prepare, that way you can defend. I mean, the the enemy hates that we're even talking about him today. He would rather it be an invisible war and you think that there is no enemy at all, that nobody is coming against you. Why? Because then you can be caught off guard. And that's what the enemy wants. But until we know who the enemy is, where he is, and what he's trying to do, um, we're going to have a difficult time defeating the enemy and withstanding the attacks of the enemy as well. And the truth is, the Bible has a lot to say on this topic a lot to say. And so let's go ahead and start off. Number one, we have three enemies. The first one that we talked about found in verse two is the world. It said, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. You might be confused by this point. It's not talking about um, 
well, let me, I, I guess, try to explain it this way. It's talking about like the world systems, if you will, that put pressure on us to conform and be just like everybody else. Does that make sense? That's what it's talking about here. Jesus was not of this world, and neither are we. We are just passing through. This is not our home. Although we want to make it as comfortable as possible and not go through hardships and make our lives great, this is not our end destination, church. It's not. We are just merely passing through. As Peter mentions in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 11, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as what? As foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. We are foreigners to this world. Another translation says uh, pilgrims, if you will, that this place is not our ultimate destination. This is not what we're to build mansions with and then dwell forever and ever. God has a different idea in mind, and our end destination is with him forever in eternity with Jesus. That is our end goal and end uh, destination. And then Romans 12, 2 even goes on to say about this war against the world. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The unsaved person, the somebody that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, whether consciously or unconsciously, they are being controlled or even manipulated or deceived by a lot of the things of this world. And I don't even think I really have to give any particular examples. I think a lot of those come to your mind, right? I'm just like, why is the world moving in this direction? Why is everybody believing in this lie? Why does everybody think this way when this is the truth? And I mean, I sometimes feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Do you guys, can you guys relate? I'm like, what is everybody thinking? But I'm reminded of the book of Judges where everybody did what they thought was best in their own eyes. And when we don't have the Bible as their guide, that's what's going to happen. They're not being guided by God. No wonder I feel out of place in this world. No wonder I feel like I don't fully fit in and I'm constantly going against the grain because Jesus was not of this world and neither, um, neither am I because he has saved me for something greater uh, there's a book out there uh, for all, how many dog lovers? You guys love dogs? Yeah, pet people. So there's a dog out there. I'm not trying to make fun of this book or anything, but there's a book out there that is titled Why Your Dog Does What It Does. Okay, I don't know if you ever heard that book before, but Why Your Dog Does What It Does. And I thought of that title, and I'll save you a little bit of time, because when I read that title, I'm like, well, duh, it's because he's a dog, you know? <laughs> Your dog does what he does because he has the nature of a dog. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And in the same way, why does a sinner behave like a sinner? Why do I, you know, behave like, like everybody else? Oh, I skipped my second point. I jumped ahead, but okay. Uh, let me, I'm going to circle. I'll come back to that dog book. I'm sorry. So number two, oh, number two, three enemies. The flesh is our second one, okay? So number one was the world, the pressures that we have. Number two, the flesh, okay? I'm going to come back to that point. But Ephesians 2, 3 talks about the flesh. It says, all of us who lived among them at one point, uh, one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. So my point with the dog book was talking about this flesh where, yeah, a dog behaves like a dog because he or she is a dog. And why does a sinner behave like a sinner? Like, have you ever you know, wondered, like, why do I keep struggling with this? Why do I keep messing up? We mentioned that nobody is perfect. Why can't I be perfect? And, and I, I have Jesus in my life, but why do I keep go, doing the wrong thing? Well, it's because we have the nature of sin. We were born with sin in our lives. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, surely I was sinful. When? At birth. It wasn't like, you know, all of a sudden that your child you know, started talking and, and lying or whatever, and you were like, oh, like, they lied. What am I doing wrong? Like, it, it wasn't like this crazy aha moment or anything. It was, yeah, my, my kiddo's not perfect, 
I'm not perfect either. And it wasn't this huge shocker. Psalm 51, verse 5, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And it's not a shocker when, I, when any of us mess up or we fall short or our kids do as well because we have this sinful nature within us. And so that is our second enemy. We have the world that pressures the world. Keep going this direction, Ryan. You know, be like everybody else. It's okay. Just try to fit in. And then our flesh, where I'm battling my own flesh, that I'm striving to live for spiritual things, trying to do the right thing, trying to do the righteous thing and live for God and do the good thing. But I have this internal battle, this internal war within that, that I'm pu- being pulled constantly away from Christ. That's our flesh. And then our third enemy, which obviously I already kind of alluded to that we're going to be talking about today, is the devil himself. We do have a, a third enemy, and it is the devil. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and who else? And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, referring to Satan referring to the devil. We do have a third enemy, and it is God's enemy as well, and it's Satan. Now, I get it. We don't like to talk about him much. Um, I don't like to give him a whole lot of credit. I think a lot of the time that we don't want to talk about him as much as well is I feel like for many of us, we've been taught culturally or maybe through cartoons or whatever else that we feel like God is here and Satan is here. And they are on the same level. And they're battling, and it's good versus evil. And so I think one of the reasons maybe why we don't like to talk about him is because, man, like, I mean, it's 50-50, and I don't want to make him angry, and I don't want to put a target on my own back. So it's just better just not talking about him or thinking about him or anything. And so I I would just rather not. A lot of people don't, but the crazy thing is the Bible has a lot to say about our adversary, the devil. Um, Ephesians 6, if you were just to turn a few more pages in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 11, and I'll have the verses up on the screen as well. But uh, we're going to go through this section, just so you know, the armor of God, 10 through 16, very much in detail next week. Um, But for today, I want to go through at least 10 through 12. Right now, 10 through 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Um, Our enemy, the devil, he has many different names, and I included some in your notes. Um, It's important to note that the the name devil literally means accuser, and it says throughout scripture and even revelation, um, he accuses God's people night and day before the throne room of God. He's constantly accusing, and maybe you have felt that at times, where God is constantly accusing and saying all these different things about you. You know, oh, you're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. You know, who's going to love you? Who, you're, you're never going to measure up. I mean, all these different things accusing you and even bringing back maybe a lot of your past back into your face, in a sense, to try to discourage you and turn you the other way. The other name, uh, Satan, it literally means adversary. That is what the name Satan is, and he's called that because he is the enemy of God. I'm going to go pretty fast right here. Um, I'm going to have a slide at the end with all these different ones, so don't worry. Um, but Matthew 4, 3, um, I want to go ahead and bring that up real quick. Here's another one that he's called. He's called the tempter. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. That was Uh, the devil coming to Jesus, and Jesus referred to the devil, and so if we believe that Jesus is God, um, he referred to the existence of the devil, so we can't get around that, but the devil is called the tempter. He tempts us with different things. Um, The next one would be John 8, 44. He's talking to the religious leaders, so don't worry. This is not like a verse towards you guys, but towards the religious leaders that uh, Jesus is talking to, but he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not uh, holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father lies. So we see by this verse, he is a murderer. He is a liar as well. That's who we're dealing with, our enemy. Um, 1 Peter 5, 8 compares him to a lion. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like, keyword like, doesn't mean he is a lion, okay, but like a roaring lion, looking for someone 
to devour. That's what, who our enemy, the devil, is. He's just looking for somebody to devour. He just wants to take them down. Um, Genesis 3, 1 and Revelation 12, 9 refers to him as a serpent. And I love this, how the Bible bookends, it closes. It says it in Genesis, it also says it in Revelation, you know, who he is. He's the serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And that's what he does. He doubts God. Did he, God really say that? Has God really called you to ministry, Ryan? I mean, really? Did God really forgive you of your sins? This is the, one of the strategies of the enemy. A uh, Revelation, bookend 12, 9. Um, it says the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. Kind of goes back to our first point, our first enemy, right? He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So that's referring to it in Revelation 12, 9. Um, he's also referred to as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. And so more or less, he wants to deceive us by maybe appearing like he's good. Maybe it's another, you know, a cult religion. Oh, yeah, we're great. Look at all of our deeds. Look at what we do, you know. I mean, this is what the enemy is trying to do from an outside perspective, trying to masquerade as an angel of light, when in fact, really, what he's trying to do is deceive. Uh, John 10.10, 10, I think we have that one. Uh, he's referred to as a thief. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's Jesus' words, obviously. And so he's referred to as a thief. And then uh, my last one, he's also referred to as the God of this age. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Um, here's that list. I know we have one slide at the end if you wanted to get some of that down or if you're a note taker. Love my note takers. I am just like you. Um, I, in order for me to pay attention, I have to take notes. It's just how God wired me. So I get it. But you can take a picture with your phone as well. Those are all the different scripture references. But you might be thinking, okay, well, where did this guy come from? Okay, I mean, we heard about who he is, okay? We've got the devil's name. We've got Satan's name. We have all these other ways in which he was referred to as well. Um, most scholars believe that uh, in the original creation, his name was Lucifer. I'm sure you've heard that name before. Um, and so where that's taken from and, and where a lot of people believe where he came from is referred to as the son of the morning is taken from Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, I think it is. Um, yeah, we have the verses here. He says, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, and these are the, all the I wills by the enemy. And this is where pride set in for Satan. I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zavin. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. And so many scholars, you know, obviously they believe, okay, well, this is talking about the downfall of Satan. That, you know, it's talked about that he was once an angel. In fact, a lot of scholars believe, and, and it's taken from a particular uh, point in Revelation, that one-third of the angels actually followed him as well. And so this is what we're dealing with. And I know, like I said, many people don't like talking about our enemy and talking about the devil. It probably makes a lot of us uncomfortable, maybe even squirmish. But you guys, like I said, for many of us, we just need to understand that we do have an enemy that is out to get us. And the very fact that you have been created, I mean, I've always thought about this, the one thing that the devil cannot do, or there's a lot of things he can't do, so actually take that out, but one of the things that he can't do is create. He can deceive, he can twist, he can counterfeit, but he can't create, and we are God's created beings, and he hates that. He hates that we are God's created beings, and especially now when we're back on track and following him, he hates that as well. He wants to do anything to try to take us out whatever way he can. Um, 
wanting to provide a little bit of encouragement on that note, because the devil is a created being, that means he has limits, okay? So I think there's a popular belief out there, which I don't see anywhere in scripture, that we think the devil is at all places all at once. He's not omnipresent. He's not God. He's not at all places all at once. He's also not all powerful. This is not a balance like this where they're, you know, battling against each other. Who's going to win? God is all powerful. He is not. The devil is limited in space. He's also not all knowing like God is because he's not God. Um, he's also, you know, God, on the other hand, he is all powerful. He is all knowing. He hears all of our prayers. He's there for us when you need it. If you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit within you as your helper as well. And so you have the Holy Spirit on your side and God is with us as well. So we have so much to counteract our enemy. And unlike God who is omnipresent everywhere at all times, the devil cannot be at all places at once. He's just one person. And I know when I was studying this, I was like, okay, well then how does he re you know, uh, release so much havoc on the world? Like, why do we have the mess that we ha are in, you know, that we look at? Well, it's because it's not just the devil. I alluded to it. A lot of scholars believe one third of the angels fell. It's because he has an army as well. That's why. Ephesians 6, 12, continuing on, it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The way he's able to accomplish so much is because he has an army as well that he is able to go to. Notice the plurality in all of those that we just read. The rulers, authorities, powers, uh, spiritual forces, those all speak of many. It's not just like the devil is all those different things. He's just one person. And so, yes, the enemy has an army that he wants to utilize to try to take us out, to try to take us down. And the important part here, guys, that I want you to take away from, me, from with this is that the devil is real and he's one of the enemies that we face. It is an invisible war that is behind the scenes that we don't really think about very often, guys. Here are some of his abilities. Here are some of his abilities. If you remember in uh, Ephesians 6, 11, we, when we mentioned the devil's schemes, this is what that word schemes literally means. Schemes literally means uh, wiles, um, cunning, uh, crafty arts, and strategies. His tactics work against us very well because he's been doing it for so long. Anything that you come across today where you're like, oh, wow, that was like a new attack from the enemy. No, it's just repackaged. I think of like, uh, you know, I was at the Mead football game on Thursday, and there's a lot of plays that teams run. But it's, I mean, generally what? Pass play? Running play? I'm not a football coach. Am I missing any? <laughs> but I mean, that's pretty much it, right? But every play is repackaged to try to look differently. You don't just say, all right, guys, we're going to run up the middle again, okay? And you do that every single time. You switch up your plays. You try to use deception. You try to, okay, we're going this way, this time, and this way. And the same thing with the enemy. He has the same tactics, but he just packages them differently, especially in this modern day. Um, lust looks totally different than I'm sure it did 2,000 years ago. Just packaged differently, right? Now it's mainly through phones and computers. Not mainly, but you know what I'm saying. Pride now disguised maybe through social media as well, where you're trying to get likes and loves or whatever else on there, you know. Confidence, you know, in yourself. That maybe we can even convince ourselves, well, it's okay. As long as you're confident, you're a strong leader, which maybe it's just pride. Maybe we just have to actually die to our own pride. Materialism, well, I'm just putting my family first. You know, that's all I'm doing. But all of a sudden, it's consuming us, and that's what we're doing and not putting God first and not spending time with him or not going to church. It's just packaged differently. Does that make sense? That's all it is. His attacks and methods are using our two enemies against us. And what are his methods of attack? Temptations. Just tempts us. We saw he's the great tempter. Just wants to tempt us with the same thing. Oh, that worked. I'm going to tempt them with that again. And when they think that they're strong and they beat it, I'm going to tempt them again. But now I'm going to do it through a friend or I'm going to do it through a neighbor. And he just repackages it, tempts once again. Accusations. Wow, that really worked. 
they were really discouraged by that accusation. You know, they're lacking in a lot of self-confidence, or they're really holding on to that. All right, now I'm going to come at them from this side. I'm going to have somebody else bring that up to them, and let's see how that goes. Temptations, accusations, deception. Did God really say that? We already talked about that. And I believe, this is just my own opinion, I want to make sure to preface, I think one of the attacks of the enemy is, is doubt. I think that's probably one of the first attacks from the evil one, of just, you know, causing you to doubt, doubt your church, doubt the validity or trustworthiness of the Bible, doubt, does my spouse really love me? Do my kids love me, you know? Doubting a lot of those different things in your life where then he can begin to try to chip away and maybe lead towards something um, even bigger. Um, the truth is, I want to make sure to preface this, if you're going the right direction and you're moving towards God and this is not a feel-good message, you're going to experience some different spiritual attacks. And I can't say that any better, and I don't mean to say that to scare you or anything, but if you're heading in this direction, there's going to be that opposition. There's going to be opposition from the world. Your flesh is going to strive to be like, oh, remember when we were back over here? But then also the devil is going to try to place different things in your life to try to get you to turn back around. And if you're not experiencing any spiritual attacks, I would say, are you heading in this direction? Because if you're over here, the enemy's not going to spend any time with you. I mean, think about war. Yeah, that, you know, rebels over there or whatever, they don't mean us any harm. We're good. Let's focus on these people that are going to Grandview Church. They're serving and loving their community. You know, let's focus on them. These guys over here, I don't know what they're doing, but let them keep doing what they're doing. You know, they're off in Lulu land. But over here, this is where we need to center our attacks. And so that's one thing I want to make sure to cover as well. I do want to end on a high note so I want you to know my goal is to encourage you today, but I wanted you to be aware. But here's the awesome thing, guys, that I want to end with, okay? I want to end with how we fight back. You guys ready for it? Okay, this part's good. You know why? Because it's in God's word. God is so much stronger, you guys. Romans 8:31. what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us, you guys? If God, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, everywhere at all times, if he is for you, we don't have to worry necessarily so much about the things of this world and our flesh and the enemy. What? There's a devil out there? Guys, God is so much bigger. God is bigger than the devil. God is bigger than the world. God is bigger than your flesh. God is bigger than your problems and the problems that you face. God is bigger than your hurts, habits, and hangups, church. God is bigger than your addictions. He is. So that's my encouragement to you. Yes, we do have a real enemy, three enemies in this world, but God defeats every single one of them. He is so much bigger, so much stronger. The other verse I want to leave you with is James 4, 7. Here's one way to resist. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so resist the devil when you experience those temptations, accusations. I mean, I like to quote Jesus' words. Get behind me, Satan. Like, I, I love that. I love that verse that Jesus even said that, where I'm like, you know what? Not today. The ranch packet, all right, I'm not going to attribute that to you. But the discouragement I'm feeling, uh-uh, not today. Because God is for me, and I'm going to resist the devil and the attacks of the devil, and it says that the devil will flee from you. 1 John 2.20, here's another one. This one I love. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Another translation says the Holy Spirit. You have, if you're a believer in Christ, the best weapon or one of the best weapons is the Holy Spirit inside you. You have God with you, God encouraging you, God bringing to mind you know, hey, we shouldn't be doing that. Him, him convicting you and bringing you back or bringing those Bible verses to mind. The Holy Spirit is in you. If, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I've got God's Spirit in me against the things of this world. Let's go, God. Bring it on. Let's, let's do it together. It's not like God's abandoned me, Ryan, you're on your own. No, I've got God with me, you guys. And then finally, 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 through 3, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. 
we've only touched the surface. We're going to go over Ephesians 6 in detail next week. But my goal for today was that you would notice and you would realize, acknowledge we do have enemies in this world, but you guys, we also have God. We also have God on our side, so we shouldn't be discouraged. We have God's help. We have the Holy Spirit in us and also the power of prayer. Guys, you know how I was saved, I believe? And here's that tissue. I'm ready. <laughs> I believe I... 100%, I was saved through prayer. Atheists far from God, running the opposite direction, mad at God, angry at God. My mom's prayers, I really believe, saved me. There is power in prayer. I've seen it in my own life. Maybe you've felt let down by God at times. Maybe you feel like he wasn't there for you. God is there for you. I want to encourage you. Maybe he didn't remove you from the fiery furnace, but he was in the fiery furnace with you. Maybe he didn't take you out of the valley, but he walked the valley with you, and he's still with you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And I tell you what, the power of prayer, you guys, I feel like we don't even know how powerful our prayers are. And so that's why we've been taking our church, you know, through these times of of, of prayer, where we're all praying together and we're walking through scripture. You can turn any scripture into a prayer. And that's why we pray for the nation of Israel. And that's why we pray for you guys specifically, individually. We make prayer a priority because it is powerful. And I don't understand. I'm just being honest as a, a pastor. I don't understand how prayer works. I want it to work how I work. And I connect the dots and it doesn't work that way. But I know this. Prayer is powerful because God is powerful and prayer works. And so I want to encourage you coming off of today to be not just reactive, not pray reactive prayers, but proactive prayers. How can you be praying for your family? How can you be praying for your kids? How can you be praying for your spouse? How can you be praying for our nation? How can you be praying for those in authority? How can you be praying for your neighbors or those who are lost? How can you be praying for your own health? I want, I want to encourage you to be proactive in those things, not wait, oh, now we're going through it, and now we pray. Instead, we're ahead of the game. I've been praying for this because I believe in the power of prayer, and I believe and I've seen what God can do. And so, therefore, I'm going to pray for my family, my spouse, my kids, the nation, the next generation, whatever else is on my prayer list, and I'm going to be faithful to do it. And I want to encourage you, your prayers, guys, God's not looking for elegance in speech. He doesn't care if you can murmur this perfect prayer. Why? When he, Jesus came to earth, his biggest problem was with the Pharisees who are elegant in speech and trying to look all grand and everything from the outside. What he cares about is your heart. And so if you can just say, God, help me. God, I need you. That prayer is enough. And that's a powerful prayer, church. So my encouragement, my challenge to you today, guys, make prayer priority in your life, waking up in the morning, before bed, whatever it is, whatever way that the Holy Spirit's convicting you of and speaking to you today. I want to end with this, guys. God is so much stronger. We have an enemy, but God is so much stronger, and that's why we rely and we trust in him, and that's why we go to him in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God, and Lord, I know I went a little over in the sermon today, but Father, I just pray your Holy Spirit used it. God, I pray for not just a miracle in the speaking today, Lord, as I've already prayed this morning, but God, I pray for a miracle in the hearing, that God, we wouldn't be discouraged by today's message. Hopefully, Lord, it gave us some things to think about, maybe even go back and read your word more. But more importantly, Lord, I pray that we would see the importance of prayer, the importance, God, uh, of knowing that there is an invisible war, but also knowing, God, you are on our side. And God, if you are for us, who can be against us? God, I pray for those that raised their hand earlier, God, that are going through something or going through a difficult time. Um, God, we just want to lift them up to you once again and just ask that you would draw near to them, Lord. I love that verse. Uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so, Father, I just pray as we draw near to you that, Lord, they would feel your presence that, God, they would feel at peace, knowing, Lord, that you're going to go ahead of them, and you're with them, Lord, even in the midst of the valley. 
God, we also lift up once again the nation of Israel. We ask for protection. Your word says to pray for Jerusalem, and Lord, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, for everybody affected, Lord. Um, I think of the kids. I think of families, God. It breaks my heart. Just pray, Lord, for protection. Pray, God, for wars and, and, and evil to end, God. I know one day um, it will all end. But in the meantime, Lord, we do pray um, that, Father, you would use everything um, for your good, that you would use everything to draw people to you, Jesus. God, I also want to pray for those who are far from you. Maybe one of those people are here today. Uh, we talked about how the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of prayer um, it's an amazing gift that we have, an amazing weapon that we have access to, Lord, to be able to fight back against the things of this world and our enemy. But God, the truth is, for somebody that doesn't know you or doesn't have a relationship with you, they're not on the right, um, they're not in the right withstanding with you, Lord, that, Father, they need you. They can't pray to you unless they know you. And so, God, I pray for their salvation now, that they would know, as we covered earlier, that grace, or, or we are saved by grace, through faith, and through Jesus, by Jesus. And it's nothing of ourselves. We don't have to do anything, God. All we have to do is believe. It's our faith that saves us. And so, God, maybe that person's watching online. Maybe they're here in this room. This is important. We're going to take a moment for this, that they would stop what they're doing, and they would just pray to you right now and place their faith in you for the very first time. God, we pray for salvation today. We pray for reconciliation. We pray, God, that you would remind them how much you love them. And you are never going to give up, God. You're always going to chase them. You're going to give them every opportunity to turn to you. But God, I pray that today is the day that they would place their faith in you for the very first time. That God, they instead would do an about face and they would start walking with you. God, thank you for the decisions here today. Thank you, Lord, for the power of prayer. God, make us, help us, Lord, to be better prayer warriors. Help us continue to pray day in and day out and to see the importance, the need for it, Lord, and to never give up. We love you, God. You are stronger. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, guys, if you would, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to go ahead and close this last worship song. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from always my soul let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life always my song for you are good
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna so good and as, even as I was just sitting here worshiping you Lord I was reminded God uh, you have defeated the enemy Lord you defeated the enemy on the cross and Lord I know he's trying to wreak havoc and do as much havoc as possible but God you are good and you are all powerful Lord and the war ultimately is over um, but God we're just waiting Lord until that day when you come back and we get to see you Lord face to face God, thank you so much, Lord, for today, for how you used it. Lord, I pray, Father, for everybody here as we go our separate ways, that you would be with them the rest of this week. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome, guys.